Gosh, I didn't get your name. I'm John Spaulding. John Spaulding? Yeah. Is it S P A L D. A L D. S P A L D I N G. Yes. Kind of like the baseball. Yeah. Spaulding baseballs. You know, yeah, we never had the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now it's recording for sure. <sighs> Well, did you, did you explain to him? I a little bit you're interested in Spalding, and both you guys are researching him. Yeah, I'm not Spalding. We're in the forest. I mean, forest. forest, 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 forest. I'm the forest all guy. All and, right. Yeah, um, and for the last few years, actually, I'm the, the first person that's really written anything serious on his death. And uh, I don't know what... Let, let's get your background a little bit first. Well, I joined the Navy, and I was in the Navy at Princeton University as an instructor. Ah, oh, you you were a student at Princeton. Attached to Princeton University. Attached to by the oh, Navy. I see. Okay. ROTC and, uh, there. They have huh? they have Navy ROTC. Uh, and, Navy ROTC. Okay. And uh, Commander Barker, the executive officer of the ROTC program. And I were very good friends. Uh -huh. Is that B A R K E R? Bar B A R K E R. Mm -hmm. They're from a real Navy family. Mm -hmm. I met him down in Cuba. He took me for my first submarine ride, and uh, he's a very good friend of our family. But I mean, Navy family at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was over at his house drinking. This has nothing to do with the story. Mm -hmm. But he was telling me about he was going to get a divorce from his wife. And uh, we got a phone call from Captain Richards. It said, Forrest Hall is going to land out in Mercer Field, which is about 10 miles from Princeton, in about uh, 40 minutes. Yep. Excuse me. Good morning. No. And uh, we were sitting there drinking at his kitchen table. And I had a half a load on because we were talking about, I don't know what, I took him to Cuba, I bought him furniture for himself. But anyway, he said, I'm not going to pick him up. And I said, I'm not going to pick him up because I don't know how to drive. I just said that, you know, I didn't want to pick him up. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know who Forrest Hall was. It worked. <laughs> I he was Secretary of Navy then. And we had an old Chevrolet there. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, you'll have to pick him up because i give you an order. So I went out to Bushfield. And I didn't know anything about Secretary of the Navy or anything. This would have been about 1945, or would you say? I'd say 44. 44. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, yeah. The war was I have it on. there by record. Yeah. Okay. And I was up there. And uh, when, I, when he first came over to the car, he said, I'm James Forrestal. He shook my hand. And I said, I'm John Spaulding. But I said, I'm very dumb. I don't know how to drive. I don't know anything. I was told to come out to pick you up. And I said, uh, take you to President Dobbs' house. And he said, well, that's all right. They introduced me to a captain there and a rear admiral. So they got in the car, we, we drove in, and uh, I think I was with him about four days, driving around Princeton. And set, and, uh, I got to know him, but he talked a lot. I was surprised, but I, mean, I didn't know anything. I played dumb as hell. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to know anything about all this. So uh, he said, how would you like to go to New York? He said, summer school's almost over. And he said, uh, I'd give you a place in New York for me to drive me around New York. I said, hell, I don't know anything about New York. <laughs> I said, I'd be, in, I'd be out in the farm. I said, I don't know anything. He said, I'll help you. Mm -hmm. That was surprising. You don't hear a man like that say that, which was very true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how long it was, but he transferred me to New York. And uh, I was his chauffeur. And 
What was your rank at that time? First class boats of me. Okay. And uh, he always promised to make me chief. <laughs> you know, that was a promise, but it was never, never carried out. But uh, he, he was the smartest man that I ever knew. I mean, I would take him uh, to Metropolitan Club and everything else. I didn't know anything about New York. Mm -hmm. One thing I knew, the West Side Highway and the East Side. As long as you could tell me that, I'd have an idea where to go. But he was sitting in the back seat of the car. We had uh, Major Bowie's limousine assigned to the Navy at that time. Mm -hmm. And he was sitting in the back seat. And my God, he would tell me exactly where to go. And uh, if I take him up to Barney Bruce State the first time, he said, five miles out of the road, turn right. And he never looked up from that paper. <laughs> I mean, I just know this stuff, you know. But you know, I was telling him, I said, uh, I used to get him all the newspapers in New York and keep a count of it in a little black book I had. <laughs> and when he would pay me, he would pay me in the exact cent. <laughs> Never anything over or under. Did you meet his wife and family? Well, Josephine? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. Did you Did you notice she had a drinking problem? Did yes, you? I believe a little. He didn't like her. He didn't like her? No, sir. <laughs> she <laughs> called me up one day. Uh, she said, John, would you take me to the, the department store? I said, where? She said, to Peter's. I never knew about the Peter's department store. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll pick you up. I'll take you in. Uh, she treated me good. Mm -hmm. I mean, she always gave me something. Uh, when I drove her anywhere, I think I only drove her maybe a couple times. But uh, I took her that day. Forrest all found out about that. And he told me, don't you ever do anything more for her. Mm -hmm. You forget her. She's out of your life. <laughs> and I listened. I listened. She used to call me regular, take her somewhere, but I would always have an excuse or something. Mm. But he never liked her mm. for some reason. I don't know why, what happened there or anything. Mm. Yeah, he was described as a workaholic who was just married to his work. Yeah. Did you, you notice that? Too? Well, he told me, I, I now, don't quote me in this, but... I think one time, he said he graduated from Princeton. But he didn't, exactly. Huh? He, he was one credit short, one course well, short of he, graduating. And he went to work for Dylan Reed, yeah. stockbroker. Right. And he said he had uh, either $42 in his pocket or $72. Mm hmm and he said a year later I was a millionaire. A year? A year later? No. I don't know if I got... dollars back then was a lot of money, too. It was a lot of money. <laughs> you would, I mean, I didn't even know what a million dollars was. <laughs> but uh, that's what he told me. I'm pretty sure of that. He said, uh, John, I don't know how this conversation ever came up. But he had 42 or $72 in his pocket. And I don't know, was she married then? I don't know. No, not yet, no. No, yet, uh, okay. And he said a year later I was a millionaire. So he yeah. must have been there doing the read. Yeah. He made a lot of contacts when he was at Princeton. You know, he was the editor of the student newspaper. And he met a lot of people, I think. According to the biography, so he, <coughs> he traded on all of his contacts that he had made at, at Princeton. Uh, a lot of families of rich people, and that's who you want to sell bonds to. You know, so that, that was, but he was also extremely, as you say, intelligent and hardworking, and uh, that that that's how he he was so successful. So he's a very good friend of Dillon's, yeah. who was president of Princeton. Uh, he always stayed at his house. Clarence Dillon was. Uh, are you telling that that Dillon or something? Like that? Well, but Dillon president. The I don't. I don't think so. No. Whoever it was, I remember. I used to always go when we would arrive there. If we go from New York, I would always go get him a bottle of Hagen Hague scotch uh -huh. and take it over to him and give him to him. Uh -huh. 
Now, did you did you go to Washington D.C. after that? We we spent the whole time up in New York, New Jersey. Yeah, right? I was just shining strictly to him when he was in that was, area. Yeah, that she we left Princeton University. That's where I was transferred uh-huh. to New York. To New York, I was strictly when he would come to New York. New York, okay. to Washington. I was with him. Uh, you, you said that he, he met often with uh, Bernard Baruch. The, the oh, yeah, Brian Baruch, and uh, who was uh, Postmaster General uh, Farley. Farley. Jim Farley, yeah. Uh, let's see. He was a very good friend of, uh, you know, as I was the other day. The Navy. Uh, Ferdinand Eberstadt, does that ring a bell? He, Who? Ferdinand Eberstadt. He was a, a, one of his Wall Street contacts who he took to, to Washington to work. I don't remember. And that doesn't ring a bell. Huh? No. Uh, the Navy League. He was a very good friend of the Navy League. The Navy League, huh? And Farstall used to stay at uh, the Waldorf Astoria. A lot of times he stayed at uh, Rich Carl uh-huh. was a difference between there. Uh-huh. But I never, uh, I never forget one time uh, we drove in the back of the uh, Waldorf Astoria, and the Pope was there on a visit, mm-hmm. and everybody kissed his ring or something. I stood there like a dummy. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell uh, this was all about, you know. And he, he came and explained everything while he was, and he said, next time you see him, you do the same as they do. <laughs> he was very blunt in everything he did. Uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, this time he would you, you, but he didn't mean it that way. Uh-huh. But, uh, did he go to church, John? Huh? Did Forrest all go to church? Mm-hmm. I don't remember. Yeah. Does the name David Niles mean anything to you? He was a Jewish guy who was no, but, the Roosevelt uh, administration and the Truman administration on New York pol. He was the primary liaison to New York politicians. And, and uh, David Niles. Uh, the one that rings a bell with me, he was listening to is a is a priest that was on the television all the time. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Fulton J. Sheen. Yeah. Oh, I don't Bishop mean, Fulton J. Sheen. I don't believe it was Sheen. No. He was on television. Not Spellman? That was later. Not it? Cardinal Spellman? No. No. Well, I have to think of that. Oh, was it Coughlin? Co- Father Coughlin? Huh? Not Father Coughlin. Oh. No. Well, that, uh, that was, he had him along. He was his Jewish advisor. Who was his Jewish advisor? I mean, uh, he had a Jewish advisor. Marx Leva? Does that name ring a bell? No. Marx Leva? No. No. Hell, I had these names down. <laughs> Boy, I can't remember. Yeah, well, I might come back to you. Did you, ever, did you ever know his secretary, Kate Foley? Huh? His secretary, Kate Foley? He had a secretary named Kate Foley. Kate Foley, the woman? Forrestall. Forrestall, yeah. secretary. Yeah. No, secretary. I never admit. Yeah, she was in D.C. I think yeah. she was in Washington. Yeah. How about so, Maurice Sheehy? He was a he was a clergyman, a Catholic priest. Who? Maurice Sheehy. Is that name I remember? Maurice Sheehy. Yeah, no, he had a Jewish advisor and he had a priest uh-huh. that he would call on New York. And he were, uh, they were together an awful lot of times. In D.C. And they were both noted noted people. Uh-huh. I'll think that sometime. Did they all three meet at the same time? Huh? The three of them met at the same time? Yeah. And you, you took them there? Yeah. Where did you go? Well, you meet them. Where did we go? Where, where would they meet? Well, they meet, they used that to walk over the story or at the uh, Rich Carl. Uh, he went to the Metropolitan Club a lot. And they used to go there for lunch. Mm-hmm. When when was the last time you saw Forrestal, would you guess? Forrestal, last time I saw him, I don't remember the date. But the only thing I ever knew was uh, 
I was called down to Admiral Kelly's office at Donny Church Street. He asked me, he had a big map there, he said, where do you want to go for duty? I said, what do you mean where I want to go for duty? He said, well, you're going to leave tonight. You're going to go pick out a place, any place you want to go. So that was after he died, after, right? After he jumped out of the window. Uh-huh. After he, with Bethesda. Uh-huh. When did you find but, out that? But, but when but did you last see Forrest Tolland? Was Truman president or was Roosevelt president when you last saw him? Truman. Truman. So he was Secretary of Defense at that point. He was Secretary of Defense. But, but you, was, you were still driving him in the New York area. Yeah, at Secretary of Navy. I remember the late Secretary of Defense. Uh-huh. Did uh, did he ever talk about anybody following him? No. He never heard of it. No. He didn't. Uh, did you notice any change in his manner? Did he? Did yeah. He made a speech at Madison Square Garden. And he left his speech in the car. And I carried it out for all them people and threw it on the podium to him. Mm-hmm. And that day the captain that was his aide gave me hell. He said, who do you think you are throwing stuff at the secretary? I don't know if he was secretary of defense center or secretary of the Navy. Mm-hmm. He gave me hell and I never liked him. <laughs> and uh, we went to Princeton after that and uh, Admiral Richards, I mean, not that, Captain Richards, President of, uh, not President, uh, head of the ROTC program, had a party for the admirals and stuff at his house one evening while we were there. And I get out of the car and was sitting on the patio. And the big French doors you could wide open, you could see in. And I saw Forrest all pick up peanuts and throw a button and catch him in his mouth. <laughs> and I thought, what, what's going on here, you know? Mm-hmm. And he came out and made this statement to me. He said, John, I could have had any one of them women in there. He was talking about the admiral, all these different admiral wives. He said, anything to get their husband advanced, they'd do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, that's what he said to me. Yeah, he's probably and, right. Yep. Yeah. And wow. he said, Now well, that's career. That was, that career, was a funny stance. That's sort of the odd thing I saw him do. <laughs> but you were, at, that was the only change in demeanor, you know? I mean, you, you, he no, seemed to be the same guy oh, yeah. the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Right? Up until the last time you saw him, he was the same, straightforward. Yeah. In, con- in control of things very well. Uh, you didn't, you know, they, they they talked about how people noticed he he became more anxious, more, well, they described him as paranoid. You didn't notice any paranoia in him. Nope. You didn't notice any excessive concern about anything that seemed to be eating at him. That's right. Did you didn't notice any nervous habits like scratching in his, his, in his forehead? You don't remember he had any nervous habit like that? No. Yeah, you never saw it. No. Yeah. Okay. But didn't you tell me he resigned? The Under pressure from Truman. Truman sacked him. But before he went to Bethesda. Yeah, see, but... He supposedly had a breakdown the very day that he left office. And they took him down to Florida, where his wife was vacationing on the estate of Robert Lovett, who was the Undersecretary of State, who later became the Secretary of Defense. Robert Lovett doesn't ring a bell? That name? You don't remember Robert Lovett? How about Artemis Gates? Yeah. You knew Artemis Gates? Yeah, I think so. Uh, you, you don't recall the contacts? Uh, no. I, well, probably one of the one of the people. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, he was a great friend of Van McCarney. Uh huh. Van McCarney. A A R N Y. C A R N E Y. C A R N E Y. He was a vice admiral. Okay. 
And uh, seemed like he was a very good friend of Admiral Huzzy. How about Admiral Zacharias? Do you want to call him? No. Okay. Well, uh, he told me another thing. That uh, while we were preaching, the first time I ever drove, don't you ever open the car door for me. Uh, if I can't open the car door, take it out myself, mm-hmm. I don't need nobody to help me. And i never forget one time he pulled up at the ad- uh, the Waldorf Astoria. And I got out of the car and just stood there. I can't think of his name. But this day the captain come over and gave me hell. I mean, really gave me hell. Who do you think you are as a listed man by not opening the door? Yeah. And Forrest all heard him. <laughs> you talk about getting getting your ass screamed. Forrest all ran away in that captain. He yeah. said, don't you ever tell him what to do or anything like that. But he took that as a personal thing. He was very funny about that. Uh-huh. So he was... He... It was consistently throughout the time you knew him, just that same time. Yes, he was. Straight from yep. the shoulder guy yep. who you know, seemed to be very much in charge of things. Yep, but one time uh, we went to the Lynx Golf Club up in Long Island, which was very rich. Uh-huh. And, uh, but you saw his house in Long Island. Huh? He, he had a, a big mansion in Long Island, did he not? Uh, well, was, or was it a, was it not he, a big car store? I, I was never there. Oh, you were never there. Never right? there. Okay. All right. Never go a mansion. Always yeah. went to the Lakes Club. Okay. I never morning we left New York about five o'clock in the morning. And he was very talkative that morning for some reason. I don't know what, but anyway, he said. Uh, well, first of all, when we go over there, he get out and change clothes. And the pro came up to me and said, how's he feeling? Is he in a good humor or a bad humor? I said, he's the same as always, as far as I know. I wasn't going to get that thing. But anyway, uh, I walked out in the golf course while he was putting. And he missed the putt and he braved me. <laughs> I don't know, I was around the ninth floor. I don't know what happened there. I had a white uniform on. And uh, he said, John, he said, next time you walk up back at me, he said, uh, shop there. He said, I'll kick, he didn't say I'll kick your ass or something like that, but he, he said, uh, he made me miss that putt. <laughs> that made the pro laugh. He snickered and banged himself to go. That's pretty standard golfing talk. I yeah. You know, and anyway, anybody for missing something. I went in and uh, did this very smart thing, and uh, they said the maitre d' came over to me and said, "What we have to eat and everything else." And I got a little fillet steak, a couple of potatoes, and some kind of a vegetable. Well, hell, I was a young fellow and I was hungry. So I ate that, and I ate another one. I said, give me another order. I said, I'm hungry. And then I went out and was listening to the, the Giants and Dodgers play baseball. I had the car door open, and part, that, was another, that was a funny thing. Forrestal walked out. He came over to the car to me, and I was sitting there, and he said, uh, you really enjoyed your lunch today, didn't you? I said, what? Uh, he said, well, you enjoyed you had two, uh, You had two servings. Just like he wanted me to pay for that bill. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it was. He was very was cheap. Yeah. Oh, he was cheap as hell. I mean, <laughs> everything. You, yeah. And he said, uh, he stood there, I bet for five minutes. And just look at me and look at that bill. <laughs> just like you wanted me to take money out of my pocket and pay for it. I didn't say no. You second dumb. Huh? <laughs> Do you remember the name of his business manager? It's in my article, it is, the business manager. The other guy was just... Uh, John Gingrich was one of his associates. Did you know John Gingrich? That sounds familiar. Gingrich. He was one of his aides, I know. I was going to ask, I wanted to ask you something, John. Do you, do you recall that Mr. Forrestal had any enemies? Anybody? Other than his wife. <laughs> 
No. You ever talked to anybody about people that were giving him trouble? Hey, you ever talked about his son? How about Stuart uh, Symington? From the... That sounds familiar, but... But he was in the Air Force, wasn't he? That's right. He was a Secretary of the Air Force, Stuart Symington. I think he was with us one time. Uh-huh. But somewhere, I forget where. I mean, the, the biographers say that they were enemies, Symington and, and Forrestal. Could be. Yeah. I don't remember. You, you don't remember that. Do you recall anything negative you ever said about anybody? How about, about he, would, he wouldn't talk about his superiors to you, I wouldn't think. No, I never heard him talk. You complain about Especially me, he wouldn't talk. Yeah. You know. How about favorable? I mean, did he reflect on his meetings with, say, Bernard Baruch? Well, they were very good friends. Very good friends. I thought, I don't know where I got this idea, but I thought the first time we went to Baruch's estate, that they were going to run Forrest off for president. Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know where I got that idea. There was some talk of that, I think. Uh, yeah. The forest always took care of me. We went to uh, Poughkeepsie to see the boat regalia one day, and uh, we were driving along. I forget who was in the car with us, one of us. And, uh, hell, this truck turned right into me, coming right this way, made this turn. And I had to drive off the road and... The back of a small road was happened to be there. And he jumped up the paper and he said, What's going on here? I said, Didn't you see that truck? I said, Almost hit us? He said, I'm glad you're alive. <laughs> and we pulled out and we went on up to uh, the Regatta and everything else. And he would always have a room for me. And he had a room. I forget what that boat was. He came up to me and he said, John, I don't have any place to stay tonight. He said, uh, how many beds do you have in your room? I said, two. He said, you mind if I stay there? I said, no, I don't mind if you stay there. Now, me and Forrest all found out about that for some reason and gave that animal hell. <laughs> don't you ever... Don't you bother him. That's his room. That's not your room. You find your own place to stay. Mm-hmm. And I forget what admiral that was. He was a vice admiral. Mm-hmm. Did Forrest all raise tell about that? You, you had your assignment with him up to the end? Yeah. So how? when was the last time you saw him? You remember how much before? I don't remember. I, yeah. A couple of weeks ago. Like, months. how long was Truman president when when you were his contact or his I, driver? The only you know. thing I remember about Truman is one day we went to Bethesda. And they were hospital. And Captain Hogan met him at the front door and uh, showed him around. And he said, I'll show you the presidential suit. Sweet. We went up, took the elevator up. I don't think it was the 13th floor. I can't remember where it was there. But anyway, the elevator opened up, and uh, it was in this suite of rooms. The hell, there was a crap game going on. <laughs> and... They almost shit, I mean, them sailors were there, you know. <laughs> I'll never forget that guy shooting dice. <laughs> Hell, his arm stuck. <laughs> stuck out like that. What, yeah. was, what was the reason for going to Bethesda Naval Hospital at that point? Though? They wanted to see that some kind of a sweep there it was something. Uh-huh. That Truman was there. Uh-huh. Truman met Forrest all there, if I remember right. The four star was in the hospital? At no, 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 we went to visit. Just, yeah, but uh, you don't have any idea how many months before nope. his death? Don't right? have any idea. Okay. That's first but time. Truman was president, yeah, I'm certain. And if I remember right, Truman, Truman said, what's going on here? 
He said, you guys ought to have a lookout. He said, you you sailors are dumb as hell. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Truman was an army man. So. Yep, Truman was an army man. And uh, these guys were all, I never saw such a nervous bunch of sailors in my life. Like, uh, nobody knew what to say. They had that blanket. And they had some kind of a barrier they were shooting the dice against. Uh-huh. Truman said, give me the dice. <laughs> well, nobody wanted to handle the dice. <laughs> I couldn't watch you. I was sitting there watching. And finally he took the dice, and he said, give me a... Uh, come in. Come on. You got to... Your stuff's all there. You got you to gotta start. Yeah, I'll probably start. All right. It's all right there, set there. Yeah. And... Uh, I don't know if Trooper had a ten dollar bill or a twenty dollar bill, but he said, I want give me a ones. And they gave him one. Trooper signed every one of them ones, whatever he got. Mm-hmm. They gave it to each guy and he shot the dice and then picked them up. He said, Remember, the next time he said, act like somebody that's in the Army. Always have a lookout. <laughs> and we walked out. That's all I remember that, that day. <laughs> but that, that's the that, that only time I ever saw Truman. Was Forrestal with you at that Yeah. Place? Forrestal yeah. was in the party. Uh-huh. Forrestal didn't say a word. He just said back. And, uh-huh. He didn't say a word. How many people were in your group? A shooting crap. No, no, no. In your group. With the... Well, it was Captain Hogan. His executive officer, I guess there's about five at Benabar. Mm-hmm. I don't even know what the hell I was doing when I had elevators going up. Why well, I get in, because usually I didn't, I didn't bother about such things. That day, I don't know. I, That's curious, I, though. Why they would be visiting with us in Naval Hospital just to see the presidential suite? Well, there's just some reason they're there. And you don't know the reason? Nope. Huh. That's very odd. What did they? What did you do afterwards? What was the next thing they did? After that, there. Yeah. We went to well, the, no, I mean, in the, you, you're in the crap room, and then after the craps, where did they go? Well, after well, they they all went down and they had lunch. And that I went out to the car, and I don't know what I did. Mm-hmm. Hmm. We always thought the world of children after that. I mean, <laughs> what the hell I do? Down to earth, guys. And then. Uh, later on, I bet the, when I was on the USS Omaha, we had a, a guy on there by the name of Brown. Very smart. He was a first class pharmacist mate. And uh, I didn't see him for a long time. And, uh, he was attached to Truman. He went to the White House. He made chief. The next time I saw him, and he was attached, and he's the one that told me about Truman. Always had the little drink of bourbon, the way they call it. Uh, he had a special name for it. He would uh, say, uh, they gave him when they gave it to you for a cough. They always browns, brown something or something. But he said Truman always kept a bottle of whiskey in the dispensary, and he would have to. He called Brown, and Brown would always go up and give give him a shot of whiskey when he did it. Brown told me mm-hmm. he had the devil kick out of that. Mm-hmm. Can you think of some other people that you uh, met with Forrestal? Besides Bernie Brook? No, just, uh, just, uh, Postmaster General. Yeah, you know, farm and farm and farm. Yeah. Some people said that his, uh, his, his phone was tapped or his phone was bugged or he was being followed around. Do you ever hear anything about that? No. He never mentioned it. Don't speak because the phone might be, bu- or the, there might be a bug here or something. To be careful what you say. Nope. No, never. And maybe Lee would have a party for him, uh, either at the Waldorf Astoria or at the Ritz Carlton. 
there was always plenty of whiskey and scotch that I guess he put in before. And he would say to me, after I'm gone, you make sure you get up and get that, get the whiskey and stuff, the food that's left over, and take it home and enjoy yourself. Well, I had the big slack and scotch whiskeys and anybody in the Navy <laughs> I used to get. <laughs> Did you, did you ever talk about Walter Winchell or Drew Pearson? Uh, I don't think you liked one of them. Drew Pearson, probably. They were on the radio at the time, I think. Yeah. Did you ever talk about them? I remember some of it later, you know, you yeah. write a note to yourself, and we'll, yeah. if you, something comes back to you later, you maybe they Well, things keep coming back to you. Yeah, no, I'm the same way. How about the Amelia Earhart uh, disappearance? Do you ever mention that? Uh, this is a picture. I see pictures of the quilt. Of it. it must be you and your, at the time in your naval uniform. Yeah. Uh -huh. What year were these pictures taken? 1940. Navy. Did he ever mention anything about uh, the war in the Pacific to you? Did he ever talk about the war in the Pacific? The Japanese surrender? No. Nothing. Nope. No comment on the dropping of the bombs? Do you recall, did, after the bombs were, were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, did you meet with him after that? At any time? I believe that he went to the atomic bomb test. Uh -huh. I told him that his speechwriter was a first class showman. I forget his name. And Forrest Hall said, take him. And I think he went to, I forget the name of the shop. Get him a, an officer's uniform. They made him a lieutenant. Jumped him from first class to lieutenant. And he was going with him to the, the atomic, when they had the atomic bomb test. Mm -hmm. And he got uniforms, I remember that. He jumped him from first class showman to lieutenant. Do you remember seeing Forrestal after the end of the war, after VJ Day? Yes, I believe. I can't remember the years. Yeah. Well, when you when you went with Forrestal, that was while the war was still going on. When you made that Princeton. No, the war was over. It was over then. He first. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be what forty five or forty six. And then. And then you were with him until forty nine, right? Yeah. And then uh, the ship I was on, I was on the USS. Uh, Shelton that was sunk by the Japanese and uh, we were picked up and taken over to in this uh, more tie how did uh, the captain we had a captain on there by the name uh, that was the name he said to me John we went through hell or something. I said, we didn't go through so much hell because when you were up the bridge while we were sinking, you sent your houseboy down to get you some orange juice. I said something like that to the captain. And instead of bringing me back with the rest of the survivors, he shipped me off to an amphibious force. What the hell is this thing? What year was that? 44? 44. 44. 44. And, uh, I never liked him. And uh, what the hell liked him, I think, of these days. Well, did you tell me you were the eight survived? Yeah. Out of a hundred and some? Well, I don't know what I think. And one day at 90 Church Street, he walked out while Forrestal was going in. And uh, he came over and shook hands with me. Boy, he said, it's nice to see you again. And I didn't shake hands with him now. It was... He was lieutenant commander in charge of our ship, and uh, Forrest all saw this. So we saw what happened, you know. So we drove, I don't know where we went after that. 
But he said, what happened, what happened to you that day, the captain? I said, he was a captain of a ship I was on. I said, he did me dirty. He didn't bring me back with the survivors. He sent me to the amphibious force. He said, what's his name? And by God, Forrest all wrote that down. I don't know what ever happened. But we did anything about that, but he was very, uh, he wanted to know about that. Did he ever mention anything about uh, the creation of the state of Israel? Did you ever hear any talk about that at all? No, most of the time when I was with him, he was by himself uh-huh. or with his aide, which was uh, a dad. Now, the only thing that ever happened that I can't think of that captain's name, that'll come to me. But in 44, was that Forrest Hall gave me a picture of himself, a normal picture. And he said to Jack from Jim, He gave it to me. Uh-huh. That was my Christmas present. Uh-huh. What happened to that? Do you have it still? The Navy captain, that I never like, came here one day and said, that picture don't belong to you. It's not doubt about that picture. And that's at the Naval Academy, I think. And he took that picture, which I should have never gave him. But you know, being a listening band talking to a captain, you do what they tell you. But I never should have released that. Think would that be worth today? Oh, yeah. But it's got an inscription to you, to Jack. Yeah. Hmm. I can't right. think of his name. I know one time uh, we were at Princeton, this state of captain, that when I would go get that bottle of uh, Hagen Hag, uh, pitch ball for the I think you can't recall who was president of Princeton I thought it was Dillon mm, I don't know where I got that Dillon I don't think well, well I, Dillon was uh, Dillon was something about the stock market uh, Dillon Reed, Dillon Reed. Reed. Man, I think I, the, I, I don't something else president whoever was president and this David captain was coming down the steps of his house and said what's that and I said I have a president here for the president of the university. Give me that. Don't you ever talk to him like that. He gave me hell, you know. Forrest all heard that. I don't know how he heard it, but he asked me about the next morning. He said, what happened there between you and Captain so-and-so? I said, well, I said he gave me hell for trying to give that ball to the president. He said, we'll see about that. So I don't know what ever happened about that. Do you have anything that's hand inscribed by Forrest Hall? No, thing. Not a thing. Yeah. We should say some stuff. <laughs> yeah. Some scotch, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Drank up all the scotch, too, I guess. Who would it, tell me again, are the years that you served with Forrest Hall beginning and ending from when to when? You said he was Secretary of the Navy when you first met him. Secretary of the Navy to the made Secretary of Defense. You know anybody else that's still living to do James Forrest though? Or the, uh, the captain of uh, Red, uh, who was a pal that was uh, playing. Is he still he, living? He was actually listed band, uh, Red. Uh, Stone seemed to know well, a lot was the listed men who had he uh, I think raised you know uh, you depend on that just like I can't think of that first class showman's name it used to be his right speech writer did you ever talk about how he broke his nose did you <laughs> You notice his nose was somewhat flat. Yeah, yeah. yeah was, I can see if this is played here today. Is uh, yeah. is there. Yeah, a short guy too, right? 
athletic? Did you seem athletic? It seemed, it seemed like you always had the same suit. Really? You never changed. I mean, it always seemed like you was dressed in the same suit. Yeah. I used to always wonder about that. How many suits do you have? Uh, now you can re reveal it since he's dead. Was he any kind of a womanizer? Did you know? I know. <laughs> You know, and take I heard, any woman's I heard he had a woman. Uh -huh. I mean, some way or other, uh, but I never saw anything like it. But if he had an unhappy marriage, you'd think maybe he might fool around with that power, too. And as Kissinger saying, power is an aphrodisiac. And women would, and these, these admiral's wives wanting to get promotion, but he didn't act on that in your knowledge. Oh, he said that day when we left, he said, uh, did you see me in there? I guess when he came out, I was looking right in there, you know. And I said, yeah, something about that. I was wondering or something. You had to watch, you know, but I mean, I, he did that about three times. He took the peanut and threw it up. <laughs> Catch his mouth, I thought, something, boy, something's going on there. Uh -huh. Then he came out and he said, uh, he said, I could have any one of them women that I wanted, any one of their favors, something like that, you know, as long as I would help their husbands. They'd do anything in the world to get their husbands advanced. And I think every one of them there was uh, an admiral at that party. <laughs> What's the last thing you remember Mr. Forrestal saying to you? Do you remember the last time you spoke? To Mrs. Mr. Forrestal. Well. How did, when you heard of his death, where were you? And can you remember exactly? At of all Bay, Cuba. But at the time you heard of his death, you were? No, when I heard of his death, but I was over down at Kelly's office. Uh, you remember Church exactly Street. where you were at the moment you heard about it, and what? Who told you he died? Admiral Kelly. That was the same time he was telling you you go somewhere else. Yeah, that's when you found out. Yep. Why mm -hmm. did you did you, did you think that was odd? Uh, why that they're going to just ship you out like that? Didn't you? Did no, no, you? I did because. Uh, the way he, he made me sign a paper. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would never talk, you know. They had it all rolled up for me. Uh-huh. They made me sign it. Yeah, I could never talk about anything that happened between him and, and the, he, he said the secretary. I mean, that's out his road. He had his aide come in, the lieutenant, and uh, had this paper and made me sign it. Uh -huh. Was that Admiral Kelly had you sign that? Yeah. And Lieutenant Hooper came in and had the paper that said, read it, then signed it. And I signed it and dated it. How did Admiral Kelly spell his name? K-E-L-L-Y. And Hooper was spelled? Well, Hooper was his aide, nice. Lieutenant. And you, you figure that was just routine procedure, that you, you know, so, nothing, you didn't think, you weren't suspicious of anything. You just, no. Who were you, about 28 years old then or so? You went in at 40, right? Yeah. And how old were you when you went in? I guess about, I guess we're doing about 90. 18. About 27. But, right. 1949, you were 27. Uh, I always acted dumb around Forrest Hall. Mm -hmm. Never knew too much. Uh, you stay out of trouble that way, huh? Uh, yep, I played that smart, just like the first time I met him. Mm -hmm. uh, I told him, I said, uh, don't expect, <laughs> I think I told him, don't expect too much from me. I was about half loaded. <laughs> <laughs> Hell, I think we were, we had two or three drinks over in uh, Barker's Kitchen before I went to Mercer's Field. Have you ever heard anything since then about it, about his death? Told from anybody? You never you read, read it in newspaper accounts at the time of his death. So what do you think today happened? If I asked you what do you think happened to him, what would you say? 
then why would you think he would commit suicide? And then, did, did he strike you as a sort of person that was that high strung? Or weren't you kind of flabbergasted, amazed? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Were. Sure. Sure. But you never suspected anything. No, no. Uh, just he, he never said anything to you that would make you think he might do that someday? No. Did you ever see him upset about anything? No. He was always cool? Uh, he was very strict about uh, giving orders to somebody. I mean, he always seemed like he, he was on top of everything. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Have you ever known uh, any other person in your life to have committed suicide? No. So you wouldn't be able to compare him. And, uh, 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 it does seem like just the most amazing thing, really. I mean, a guy like that. Well, he jumped out the window, right? Well, that's been, how do you know that? Some You read that or someone told you that? Well, that's what... I think Kelly told me that. Kelly told me that. Kelly told me that. Well, there was a, a bathrobe cord tied around his neck. And there's some speculation in the newspapers that he tried to hang himself to the radiator out the window. Which kind of not, it seems like it's overdoing it. If you go, He was on the 16th floor. Yeah. So just going out the window is going to kill you dead enough. You don't really need to hang yourself out the window. Yeah, so that's that's enough to make people a little bit suspicious, I think, as to what happened. Why is this bathroom cord tied tightly around his neck? Yeah. Well, she like this color buck was it. Uh, something else could have happened to him. Indeed. Huh? Yes. Yes. But, but do people, do other people express some suspicion? I, I know I have a friend who worked in the Pentagon, pretty high level, about your age, and, and he said that, that there was suspicion. There was suspicion. Yes. As you're reading, I said, to Huh? As you're reading, I say, you still read? Can you still read? Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, you got the handwriting? Yeah, I brought that. I happen to have this, so I threw it in my bag. That this was a, they got a, a, a copy of the report of Forstall's death. And this was supposed to be his suicide note that he copied out of a book. And this is a copy of his handwriting. That's supposed to be his suicide note. And this is his actual handwriting. It says here, what does it say at the top? Secretary of the Navy. It's signed James Forrestal. Did he write the whole thing or just sign it? Did he write the whole thing? This is supposed to be his suicide note. Does that handwriting look the same to you? This is hard to read because it's a copy of a Xerox copy. It's kind of, yeah. but it's, but you can sort of see the slant of the letters. You can see. Do you have a lot of examples of your handwriting? Yes, I do. I got I got this from the Truman Library. I, they they sent. I, I put the both sheets on one sheet of paper so you could see it. But this is written, clearly written by Mr. Forrestal. There's lots of other samples like that. Yeah, it's sort of yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah. It looks almost left-handed. His style of writing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't need to be an expert to see. You want to take a look at it? Yeah, yeah that's look, what, I do that for a living pretty much. Oh, really? Yeah, historic documents. Oh, okay. I'm always checking stuff. Yeah. Well, you don't have to be an expert. They're not even close. But you know what? If you can get one of the qualified experts, one of the FBI guys, I've been there. He's, yeah, he's done, and they've said the same thing unofficially. I've been there with the foster case. Yeah. Experts can always exist. No, no, you got to get the right expert. There's, I mean, I'm not saying these guys that work for the FBI. This, this don't seem the same. No, it doesn't <laughs> seem the same at all. No. no. Not even close. No. no, it's not even close. Not even close. So we, 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 we suspected foul play because this is supposed to be a suicide note. Well, we're... I can't understand where I heard about foul play for the first time. 
confusing me actually to tell you. This is typical handwriting. Oh, yeah. That's typical. I've got several sheets. I just want to make sure it's typical. How long does handwriting look like that? That's... It'd be hard to get an expert to say that's the same hand. Yeah. I can, I can send you everything I've written. There's nothing about it. If you would anymore. like to read, yeah, I was gonna see it. it's pretty, it's pretty shocking. We need to always consider total adverse circumstances. I never. Like, I can't figure out where I heard something right about foul play for the first time. I do When I was down to Cuba, when I was down in Guantanamo Bay, it's all mixed up. All of this really looks like that. Somebody came down to Parsh, somebody came down and interviewed me about shopping. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what that was all about. They interviewed you, like a news person. No, I uh, think somebody in the Navy Department. Somebody in the Navy Department. Yeah. Trying to find out what you knew about Forrest. Yeah. Ah. If anything was uh, going on last time I saw her, I had anything to do with it, you know. Same sorts of questions we're asking. Yeah. Ah. When was that now? When well, I was down in Guantanamo Bay. Shortly after you got Yeah. Okay. Somebody came down and uh, mm. interviewed me. A Navy person. In, 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 in uniform. Was in uniform. Somebody from the Navy. Uh huh. You can keep that. All right. <laughs> but I don't know when I heard that about foul play. Uh -huh. About the suspicious or. Uh -huh. Well, they they did an investigation. They took the interviews of all the people that were there in the hospital that saw him the last few hours, the last few days, up on the 16th floor of the Bethesda Naval Hospital. It took them about five days to get all of the testimony. Plus, they assembled all of the medical records of the doctors, the nurses, all the official stuff, prescriptions, or whatever. Um, and then nothing happened. They didn't. They didn't say what they discovered for another six months. Six months later, they just announced, a, they put out a small release that had like six points on it. And they concluded that Forrestal had died from a fall. They concluded that no one associated with the Navy had any responsibility for that fall. And that he had been treated in the accord with what psychiatric rules and regulations and proper medical care would suggest that they should do. In other words, their hands were clean, but they did not conclude what caused the fall. And they never mentioned that cord tied around his neck in the official release. Furthermore, they didn't release all the supporting documentation. They didn't release the testimony of the people who were there. That went in the drawer where it remained for 55 years until on my third try using the Freedom of Information Act, I got it released, the whole thing, virtually the whole thing. Everything but... They took. They, I got the photographs of the room and the, and the window where he went out and all that. They didn't release the photographs of the body uh, with the stipulation it might cause too much pain and suffering for his survivors. But they also said I had uh, like six weeks to register a protest to see if I could get that. Well, I did register a protest at his urging, actually, uh, because I said he had no survivors. By that time, any family member who knew him was long dead. There was one grandchild. He had two children, Peter and um, 
Shelly had. The old one was Peter had a drinking problem. The other one had had a child. The other one died young of a heart attack and never had any children. Um, and uh, when Peter's wife was pregnant, Peter died, and so this child never knew, she not, never knew her father or her grandfather. And at the time I was writing, she was a college student out in California. The one survivor, but it's just like an ancestor. He's not like, you know, not like a loved one. Uh, and so I made that point with him. You know, there's there's a descendant, but there's not a survivor. Uh, so release it. Well, then they wrote back to me and said, uh, we lost those photographs. <laughs> Forget it. We told you mis we miswrote the first time. And so we've actually we've lost those photographs of his body. Okay. If you say so, but uh, that all of this taken together, what I'm telling you, is enough to make any reasonable person more than a little bit suspicious, I should think. Plus, of course, the contrasting handwriting of the note. Plus, lots of other stuff. Uh, photographs of the scene in his his room. This is supposed to be a, like a crime scene photograph. There's no bed spread on the bed. It's just a bare mattress. A bare pillow with no pillowcase. Nothing. He smoked a, he smoked a pipe. Did you ever know? There's no, no evidence of a pipe. No book. Nothing in the room. You couldn't tell that anybody had ever been in that room. Furthermore, the, the first person to see his room there, with the lights on and a nurse said that the bed sheets were half turned back and it was broken glass on the bed. She described it. Well, the people here in the testimony had the photographs. I said, well, you say this. Here's the... They never questioned it. I said, well, wait a minute. The photographs don't bear out. Furthermore, you know, they're supposed to take the photographs as fast as they can at the scene, like the crime scene. He went out the window about 2 a.m. You can look at the the pictures, and you can see the light is streaming in, the sunlight is streaming in from the, the from a high angle. It's many, eight hours or more after. And they never asked this photographer, when did you take those photographs? They asked, there was another photographer who should photograph the body. They asked him when he took the photographs. And he did it very quickly, very expeditiously, within about 30 minutes. But they never asked the guy who took the photo like they know what not to ask. <laughs> yeah. They never asked him when he took those photographs of the room. But you hardly have to ask because you can figure. It looks about 11 or 12, 11 a.m. It's, it's, it's well into the morning. So, John, I'm going to let you keep this because he can't really. This is a poem that he was supposed to have copied, but that. Maybe if, if you have something in your mind, because we, we, we think that Mr. Forrestal was murdered and he didn't commit suicide. I, no, 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 no. We, I know he was, we know murdered. He was murdered. I know he was murdered. But, but wait, if you have something, if you, now, if you think about him being murdered, maybe something might come to your mind. You might remember something that could lend some light to the fact that he was murdered. Well, I remember what you're talking about when this first dawned to me after I thought this over. The thing that I couldn't get straight in my mind is why, until you told me, you know, he resigned. I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. I thought he was still Secretary of Defense when he died. But to me, I don't know when, but after I found out some of the information, what dawned on me is why the highest ranking sec first Secretary of Defense would be left alone at any time, especially if he had something going on in his mind. Why would they put him on the 16th floor if he had something going on in his mind? That's why right. Why put him on the first floor? And why somebody wasn't with him? Oh. And where I got this from is there was supposed to be a nurse, a Navy nurse with him all the time, which she wasn't. Have you heard that? She was left alone. 
Well, the, the Navy orderly, a, a, a male, not a female, who was supposed to be with him. That was what was in the newspapers, that he had been left alone. And that's what they dealt with, because a lot of suspicion. How come they would leave him alone if he was suicidal? And that's, You don't. You don't. Yeah. It's but, the way that's, history what they, that's what most of this report was designed to explain away. Why? Because that's a natural suspicion, and that's what they address. And uh, in a very duplicitous way, let's say. You get two or three different stories as to why he was left alone. Did and you ever meet his brother? Yeah, Henry. Did you ever meet Henry no. or stuff? You ever talk about him? You know anything at all about him? Nope. Never talked. I mean, not the person. I never heard him. You know, it seemed like he was always business. He was always thinking. Mm. Oh, well, but... And I can't remember somebody in the car one day said something uh, that he was the most smartest he, he was the most smartest man that ever lived in the United States <laughs> that he had more in his mind and could bring things in his mind well I mean but I can't remember who said that. In his, he said that in his presence? No, no he wasn't there. Right. But they were talking in the back seat of the car. Mm -hmm. But I have a doubt. It was Pershing living then? General Pershing? I don't know. I don't think so. I can't think so if he was. But it seems like that rings a bell with me. General Pershing. But there was two of them in the back of the car. There was a high-ranking uh, army general and uh, I don't know if that old uh, Carney was there or not if it was him but they were talking about Forrestal and they said he has one of the most uh, greatest minds of anybody that they have ever known and it was sent by this army whoever was out there get that Pershing rings a bell. It makes him a man to be reckoned with. You think about that. Did, uh, did he ever make any religious comments at all? Nothing. Can't think of anything. Was he Catholic? Yes, he was raised Catholic. His mother wanted him to be a priest, but he'd sort of fallen away from the Catholic Church and probably went to the Episcopal Church if he went at all. I think. Well, what was his language? Was he? Was he? Uh, did he talk, did he curse like a sailor, or no? No, no it was very no. clean language. No, he was very clean, yeah. as far as I remember. I mean, just like the day we went in the Waldorf Astoria, in the back part of the Waldorf Astoria, you pulled in there when the Pope was there, making a visit or something. And the forest all got down, what did he do, kiss his uh, ring. ring finger? Or? Kiss his ring. Yeah. And I was just standing there like a dummy, you know. I had to get out of the car. They didn't open the car door for him. But I wondered what was going on because I didn't know anything about this ritual. Yeah. And uh, Forrest all came over and explained to me about what was going on. And the next time you see him, you should get down like everybody else. I mean, he wasn't raised and fussed about anything. He just... Just like he was telling me, you know, what to do. But I remember he got down. Mm. He kissed his ring finger or whatever. Mm. Well, it's so not like you. I mean, the more... Think of something else, sir. Yeah. But I always wondered that, too. I mean, when this first dawned on me, when it finally came to light, about why even myself as the lowest listed man in the Navy if if I was losing my mind or anything I was in the Naval Hospital they would never leave me alone and here's the highest officer the Secretary of Defense and he's left alone like that something had to be wrong 